I want to talk about something today that is uh, it's a touchy subject. Um, we don't like to talk about it. Um, we all have these issues that we have to face from time to time. And the issue is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a topic that we don't like to mention, not because uh, it's not something that we don't, um, it's not in the air all the time, but it's something that is very hard for us to give. We ask for forgiveness very easily, but it's so difficult for us to offer forgiveness to others. Uh, Horace Bushnell says, forgiveness is a man's deepest need in God's highest achievement. And you, all of us know why we're having the table today. Because God has forgiven us in Christ. And in order to do that, he just didn't go, okay, I'll forgive you, no worries. He gave his only begotten son, his most precious thing that he had, in order for us to be forgiven. So that teaches us that even us, when we forgive someone, when we forgive some people, when we forgive a church, we are called to give up that one thing that we cherish the most, the most that we've been wrong. Our pride has been beaten down to the ground sometimes. But yet, God's son died, and we have forgiveness to him. In our day, forgiveness is something forgotten. We talk about reconciliation, something that we talk more about, reconciliation. But reconciliation sometimes means that, yes, uh, we're okay, uh, we forget everything that happened in the past. You don't have to restitute whatever is lost. In Australia, we talk about uh, racial reconciliation of Aborigines and, uh, and, and Anglo-Saxons, because uh, I wasn't here, sorry. <laughs> I'm a migrant, <laughs> as everybody else actually, yeah, even the, the Aboriginals are migrants, but they were here first. <laughs> but when you talk about reconciliation, in that case, we're not talking about giving back the land. We're just talking about living in peace, which is good enough. We need to live in peace. And sometimes it takes a lot to say sorry. Do you remember when Kevin Rudd said sorry in Parliament? Doesn't matter if you were with that decision or not. It had to look that he really asked for forgiveness. That he was really sorry for the wrongs that were done. But now if somebody steps on you on the train and, and or, or, or bumps to you, what the, ah, sorry, and, and then it's walk off and forget about it. So sorry has been trivialized. The feeling of being sorry has been totally trivialized in some cases. It's very superficial. It has become a, a word filled of void, which is a contradiction in itself. Something that is void, something that is, doesn't have anything in it. That's what sorry means. In your text today, which is Luke 1 to 4, we're going to read from 1 to 4. We are called to forgive our brothers or sisters as many times as they repent. And that's easy enough because when somebody repents, they come back to you and say, Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. See, that the person who I most ask for forgiveness, first, I'm talking God, of course, I have to ask God for forgiveness. But the person I ask most for forgiveness is my wife or my children my brothers and my sisters because those are the people who live most close to me because those are the relationships that I cherish the most if you don't cherish your wife's relationship with you then uh, I think you have a problem <laughs> or the husband but that's, those are the relationships that we cherish the most and sometimes those are the times when we say sorry and those are the hardest times to come and bow, not that bow uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you my my testimony. <laughs> the other day, I take myself and and and, and uh, bowing bow before my wife and, and giving her money. 
Because I was teaching my friend, this is how you should be as a newlywed. And I went like that with a lot of fifties and said, this is how I do it every week. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why I do that? Because or else, if you know me, I buy books. <laughs> so I better give her all my money or else books appear suddenly in the house. <laughs> or they come in the, on the mail. So. And I have to ask forgiveness, but I keep a book. <laughs> So in our text, we are called to forgive our brothers and sisters as many times as they repent. That in itself is a hard act to follow because how many times are you going to put up with this person that does the same sometimes, does the same thing over and over and over again? I have a friend, he's my best friend, but he does the same thing against me over and over and over, and I, and I kind of... Coming, I was thinking about the sermon. I said, How can I put up with him? <laughs> but I know why, because I love him. Because I try to understand him. I try to he, he, he suffers from depression depression. And I have taken the decision to put up with that. Because I want to keep that relationship. And this is very important. Fostering friendship. Knowing Christ. Some people only like to know Christ. Some churches, some, some individuals, ah, I don't care about people, I only care, only care about God. Well, we have to, God came not only to save our souls, but to make us live in peace with one another. We know, we think we know God, yet we don't care if we make others feel bad. We want to live um, serving God, yet yeah, we don't care if my fellow man or my, or, my, or my other human being that is beside me needs to eat, to grow. So it's up to you. It's up to you who do you decide. Are we, are we going to take only one side or two? But forgiveness is something that we need. Do you hold grudges? How long can you hold a grudge? If you're like me, like to watch The Simpsons, there's Reverend Lovejoy saying, uh, uh, Mark Simpson says, how, 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 how long did the Holy Grudge? And then, and, then, and then she wakes up, and there's Reverend Lovejoy saying, forever, 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 forever. God doesn't hold a grudge forever, but we do. You can hold a grudge for maybe 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, any years that you are on your deathbed saying, oh, please call someone because I have a, I have a grudge against him or her and, and I need to get this out of me. You think you're going to die. And then when the person walks out of the room, you say, but if I don't die, we still, <laughs> we still have we'll still the grudge. No, we don't do that. In the Bible, we are called not to allow any bitter root that grows up because it will cause trouble and defile many. That's in Hebrews 12.15. You can read in your time, write it down, remember it. Do not allow any root of bitterness. No matter how bad it was, the spirits that you had, no matter how bad they treated you, you are supposed to guard your heart. And if you want to go now, I see some, some of you are going now, so let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews. 13. And for those who came in, uh, who are just coming in, um, you don't see us reading scripture um, because we read it way, way before the, the sermon. So, uh, Hebrews 12 15. For, from 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. So, there you go. Oh, yes, I know Christ. I've been in church all my life. Yeah, but do you have peace with fellow men? Do you keep making enemies time and time again? Because some people do that. Some Christians, they go to one church, make an enemy, and then they have to move because they make another enemy. Or you have enemies at work? Do you have enemies at school? Do you have enemies at home? So Hebrews 12, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men. Oh, with all women, of course, with everybody. And be holy. 
and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So if we have a rotten tomato in the house or in the church, what's going to happen? It's going to defile the rest. So we must scoop it up. Why do we talk about forgiveness? Because that's what we preach. That's the content of our preaching. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, Luke 24, verse 45 and 46. It says, Then he opened up their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So we have to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. We're not supposed to preach how good you can be in your business, my brother. We're not supposed to preach you are a conqueror. There's a hidden uh, hero inside you. Who can tell me who has gone through the whole week and not seen once in thought, word, or deed? Who can raise their hand? Not even little children can because they fight with their brothers and sisters because they lie to their parents. So even though they are innocent, they still do something wrong. So none of us, so we're okay with that, yeah? All of us are as evil as we can be. So you, uh, I remember when I was growing up in the U.S., be all you can be. That was the army motto in the U.S. And I used to tell myself, yes, I can be very evil. <laughs> That's the content of our preaching. You, know, you can find that also in Acts 12.38. And, and, and just to say, Acts is written by whom? By Luke. So... That's the content of our preaching. Let us turn to the text then. 1 and 2 of, uh, of Luke 17. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But woe to the person to whom they come. It will be better for him or her, because it's not always a man, it's always sometimes a woman, to be thrown into the sea in a millstone. <coughs> tie around his neck than for him to cause one of those of these little ones to see. So watch yourselves. See, there's a warning at the end. Watch yourself. Jesus had just finished talking to a very long conversation with the Pharisees and now he turns to his disciples. That's why what he, what he says. Jesus said to his disciples, He does not sugarcoat Christianity. He tells things how it is. He doesn't tell them, become a Christian and your wife will see you as the most beautiful man ever. Become a Christian and your kids will be the best behaved kids ever. Become a Christian and you, you know, the church is the, if you don't know peace, the church is the, everybody is always of one mind. Isn't it true? In Arizona? Amen. I mean, come on, come on. I left and then everything changed. Then. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus says things that cause things that cause people to sin. And in, in, in the Greek says a scandalous. I mean, it's a scandal to 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 be to stumble. I like how the ESV that Lee likes. I know that he likes the ESV. Uh, he it says to stumble as well as the um, as the NRSB, the one that I use. So you're going to be scandalized in church, my brothers and sisters. You're going to see things that you were expecting to see. Look at Corinth. What what, what happened in Corinth? To the holy one in, 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 in Corinth, the ones called by God to live holy, yet they were going and eating at, to the sacrifice idols. They were uh, having, the men were having 
connection with some other people. Somebody was there living with his stepmom. Uh, what a jerk, man. <laughs> and they were a cause of a scandal in Corinth because Paul tells them, there are sins among you who, that are living, not even heard in Gentiles, among Gentiles. My God. <laughs> So we we have it very easy here at Togo. Things that cause people to sing are bound to come, but woe to the person to whom they come. So there's a warning. Woe. Don't bring scandal into the church. Because woe to you and to me. Because I'm also a human being. First Corinthians 8, 13 tells us that Paul is willing not to cause his brother or sister not to fall by not eating meat. Why eating meat was so sinful in Corinth? Because, just to explain the text, uh, that's First Corinthians 8, 13, thank you, Scott. Uh, because what happened was that, um, who likes to eat meat here? Well, I mean, most of us are not like to eat meat. Uh, tomorrow is Queen's birthday, and for that, we don't eat meat. <laughs> but you have two choices at the market. You have a choice of, of a lamb or, or cow or, or what? It, beef, yeah, beef, beef, yes, thank you. <laughs> beef uh, that's been sacrificed, offered to the gods, and then they bring it back to the market, and then they sell it. And they say half price. But you have the other choice of meat that has been cut by the butcher, hasn't been taken to the to, to the place where they offer sacrifices, and that's normal price. Which one would you rather buy? Which one would you rather buy? So people have very weak consciences. So I said, oh, this piece of meat has been offered to the to the demons, so therefore I cannot eat it. And then Paul says, there's demons is are nothing. There's only one God. We have in Corinthians uh, 8, 4, and 5, we have, uh, because for us, there's only one God, the Father, who created all things, and only one Lord, Jesus, through whom all things come. That's it. But there are some people who don't understand that. But for them, I'm not going to eat meat, and I'm not going to drink wine. And it's, it's needless to say here in the, in the Baptist church to say wine because we Baptists don't drink wine. <laughs> Historically, Baptists were the first ones who called that we shouldn't drink wine in, in churches. And it's quite an, a turnaround in the Southern Baptists. Um, they now are drinking, uh, having communion with wine. So they have turned around just to tell you about a little bit of Baptist history because I'm Baptist. <laughs> But what happens to those people who um, who have um, who sin? What happens to those people who who consciously make people to fall? Because there are some people who like to make others to fall. If they see somebody rising in the church, they want to make him a sacrificial lamb. No, I don't like this guy going to up, up so I'm going to make sure that he gets out of the church, that he loses his faith. There's evil people among us. Don't, don't look around. <laughs> what to you if you do that? What to you? It would be better for you to be thrown into the sea. And this is a very close. So you can be thrown into the bay. Into the sea with a millstone around your neck. Than for him, for you to cause one of these little ones. Little ones. Little ones, who are the people who we care most in our society? Little ones, our children. So when somebody is a new believer and comes into the church, and you see the old believers acting like a wild pack of, you know what, wolves. What are the little ones going to learn? Look, he's been a Christian for 20 years, yet he acts like he has never known Christ. That's what happens. And this is what Jesus is talking about. So 
So what happens? It's better for them to to put a meal a, a, a millstone around their neck. Your deeds, my brothers and my sisters, your words have consequences. Your words hurt people. Your words and your deeds can destroy a church. Your words and your deeds, and my deeds and my words, can destroy a life. Don't take it lightly. Jesus says, watch yourselves not to be these people. Because we can easily fall into being these people. It's quite hard when we, when we read about this and, and we kind of think of it. Even I was always telling Lee, you give me always the very hard passages to preach from. <laughs> How are we supposed to live among one another then? Turn to Colossians 3, 13. Colossians 3, 13. Actually, uh, sorry, 3, 13. Yeah, 13, 13, 13, 13. It says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. <laughs> what a simple verse, yet what a difficult verse to put into action. Let us read again, and, and let us read, all of us. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The Lord forgave us. Jesus forgave me. And he just didn't say, I forgive you. He died to forgive. And we're called to die to ourselves, to forgive one another. Let us hope that we don't introduce a new fashion into the church. A lot of people wearing a millstone around their neck. Because we don't want to see that. We want to see a church that forgives one another. We want to see a church that is of one mind or one spirit. But sometimes forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is not to settle scores. Forgiveness is to renew relationships. Verse, verse 3. Second part. If your brother or sister rebukes, if your brother or sister sins, rebuke him or her, and if she repents, forgive him. It's very straightforward. Very straightforward. When little kids fight, what do they do? <laughs> Either they beat each other up, or they run and tell Mom and dad, he's hitting me. Hit him back. <laughs> it's funny how my five-year-old always tells, uh, he used to tell my, my, my father-in-law, uh, he just says, Papito, Papito, hit mommy. <laughs> <laughs> because she knows that he's the dad. <laughs> So it's not that Papito uh, Papito come and make mommy and me uh, become reconciled. No, just want to. Dad wants to figure out. The forty something year old kid. <laughs> no. When we forgive, we have to do it from the heart, not only from the lips. Remember what the Old Testament, what in Jesus in the, in the Sermon on the Mount says. It is said, hate, love your brother, and hate your enemy. Let us go to Leviticus 19.17. Leviticus 19.17. And I'm sorry, um, I'm making you go back and forth. And, uh, I always do that. That may be part of my Latin American upbringing. 19.17. Yeah. Oh, 
They make it as 1970. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that what? Is that what? What am I doing? <laughs> I have read the name and now because what does your Bible say? 1970. Yes. Don't hate your brother. Where? Yes. So you can keep that as a secret. I don't know if you see that that, that, that thing about Germans and French in the French and First World War that they're both shaking hands, but they have each a knife behind behind the, behind the back with the other hand. And sometimes that's how we are in the church. In the church, because he's talking about your brother. So the people who are sitting beside you. I love you, brother. Yeah, brother. But if you do anything against me. We're not called to be like that. It's a command. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. So Jesus is going back to this command of the Old Testament. Love your brother as yourself. And also Proverbs 10, 18 and 26, 24 and 26 says the same thing. You may pray the Lord's prayer. Who prays the Lord's prayer here? Who knows the Lord's prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses or sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So how can we come to the Lord and say, hey, forgive us, Lord, because, and that's it. Oh, I forgot the other part of the, of the prayer. As we forgive those who sin against us. But it's very difficult to forgive when people don't ask for forgiveness or when they don't repent. Finally, verse 4. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent. Forgive him. But if you repent that you're not supposed to do this again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. But we do the same with the Lord. How many times have you come to the Lord and asked forgiveness for the same sin? <laughs> on a weekly basis? On a daily basis? And sometimes even on an hourly basis? But yet we're not so gracious as God, are we? We ah, you've done this before, remember? Remember, you've done this before and you do it again and I told you this was going to be the last time you do it. <coughs> There's been a trouble among some friends of mine who have been destroying the body of Christ time and time and time again. What do we do with such people? They're told not to do it, then they just can't help themselves. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17, that if you destroy the body of Christ, Christ will destroy you. How are we living here as the body of Christ? In Judaism, it was more common to suggest that you should rebuke your brother time and time and time and time again. But Jesus turns this around and says, no, you should forgive again and again and again and again and again, but because it's 70 times. Uh, this is very bad for us who don't like to forgive. <laughs> He's going back to Genesis 4, 24. Genesis 4, remember that uh, when, when God, when God um, uh, took out Cain out of his land, he gave him a curse, but, but he also gave him a protection. Whoever kills Cain, whoever does wrong to Cain, seven times fall will be done to him. But then this other guy, Lamech, says this, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, Seven, seven, 77 times. So Jesus is calling us 
Revenge is unquenchable. Revenge never ends. You can, you can never quench your thirst for revenge. But Jesus tells us forgiveness. We are supposed to have an unquenchable desire to forgive those who done wrong against us. My brothers and sisters, when I was doing this last night and this morning, I was, I don't want to preach this because this doesn't apply to me. Because I'm a sinner. I like to hold God. I still remember things from my childhood. I still remember the things that I see in church since, I'm, since I can remember. I can still remember when I was in church, in the first Baptist church of El Salvador, I don't know. Uh, when somebody, I wanted a, a, a cookie. I was four. And I still remember that because I hold a grudge. <laughs> And I wanted that cookie, and then the lady gave it, uh, took it away from, from, from where I wanted to take it and gave it to someone, to her daughter. I left you with that cookie. But why do I remember that? Because, because it really hurt me. Because I wanted that cookie. <laughs> so we're the same. In some trivial thing, we call this grudge. How much if something's been wrong, is being done wrong against you? Let us not be stumbling blocks. Jesus asks forgiveness for those who crucify him. Luke 23, 34. Father, please forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Those soldiers didn't ask for forgiveness. Some people will never ask you for forgiveness, my brother and sister. Some people will never ask you, I'm sorry for the wrong I done to you. But you need to forgive to be free from that burden, to be free from that feeling. <clears throat> and only in Jesus, if we reflect to what Jesus did on the cross, to what God did on the cross for us, then we can also be able, if we are supposed to be like God, perfect, because our Father in heaven is perfect, then we are supposed to follow his footsteps. We will, we, will force, we will face stumblings, but let's not fall and stay in them. You can fall in the hole. It's up to you if you get out of it. We are to forgive those who have done us wrong, and in turn, we must strive not to make others fall by our actions or deeds or words. Jesus came to die to forgive, to forgive us, Matthew 26, 28, and we're going to say that when we have communion. God has forgiven us in Christ according to Ephesians 1 7, Colossians 1 14. Let us follow our lead from our God and Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have forgiven us from our sins. That we're going to send us to hell. Thank you for taking us as family members of your family, taking us as loved ones, people who need forgiveness. Let us in turn give forgiveness to others, preach forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness to others. Lord, it's a hard thing to do. But only through the Holy Spirit we can achieve this. Holy Spirit, please break the barriers in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in the name of Jesus. So we can be free from these feelings, from these thoughts, from these memories that are killing us, Lord. And apply your word to our lives and be free in you. In the name of Jesus.